Morning, folks. If you can type in and say hello, do so. Ah, good morning, Jean. Nice to see you. Send me a video from your garden. Uh, can you hear me loud and clear, Jean? And is the picture okay when I'm swinging? Good morning, folks. If you can, type a message in just to let me know who's there. Any questions, just type them in as well. Nice to see you. It's just 10 o'clock now. Good morning, Michael. Hope you're okay. Thanks for tuning in. Is Carol with you? Good morning, Ian. Nice to see you. I'll do a few lefty swings today for you. When I swing like a lefty, as I come down to the ball around about here, I just feel the club swing so much more freely. I don't know if it's the design of my body, but every t ever since I've done it, I find the release of the club, the power and the energy at the bottom of the swing, so much easier. Hi, Mel. Good morning, Carol. Nice to see you. Um, yeah, so I wish I always say I wish I'd taken the game to the lefty. In fact, maybe Jean can, uh, as a doctor, can advise me on that. Is the body different than the design? Is it asymmetric? I know my body's asymmetric over time because of the way uh, I play so much golf, my spine sort of tilts a bit. There's a very famous photograph of Henry Cotton. He's walking over the hill at Sandwich. He's literally walking like that. He spent all his life in that position. His spine had tilted. In fact, lots of the pros now, they... Um, the physical work is designed to balance out the body and make sure the, there's no asymmetry in their physiques. Uh, 
All righty, three minutes past. Give a couple more minutes for the, uh, so everyone can get online, then we'll get started. Yes, we're all different right to left than each other. I, just I suppose it's logical, isn't it? No perfect designs. I'm left-handed for golf and cricket and right-handed for everything else. I'm actually left-handed at pool and snooker. I think I'm right in saying Ben Hogan was left-handed but played the game right-handed. Um, I think Mickelson does a lot of things right-handed as well. Anyway, good morning, folks. Nice to see you all. Thanks for tuning in. Hope you're all keeping well and staying safe and also uh, staying in touch with each other. I think it's really important that uh, we do stay in contact. And if you have any friends who you've not heard from for a while, it might be nice to send them uh, just a hello, uh, send them one of the videos, get them linked in, any of the men other members. Uh, the more people who get to join us, the better, I think. And one of the main purposes of what I'm doing here is just to ensure that uh, club life stays the same for us, and as close to the same in obviously difficult circumstances. Alrighty, so I've got loads to go through today. I've got, uh, I'm going to talk about the head. So what we've done so far is talk about uh, the swing from the ground up. Foot position, balance, then knee and leg action, which oftentimes we talk about being hip action, but it's actually leg action. Then the rotation of the trunk, then the position or the plane that the arms swing around to here. Now the head, inside and out today is our topic. And we're going to start with the outside, the easy part, first of all. So when I set myself up the ball here, whatever the club, and also I've got a question from John Cardwell today, which I'm going to answer. Whatever the club, ideally, when I set myself up, I want my spine and my head to be aligned. So when I put, my head isn't tilted, it's aligned. When I have my driver, the ball is forward in the stance, I lean back quite a bit, but you should see that my head and spine are aligned. Think of the weight of the head. I think it's about one eighth of your overall uh, body mass. If it's misaligned, it will misalign shoulders and spine and all sorts. So if you address the ball here, we don't address the ball with our sh shoulders level because the glove hand is higher on the handle. Therefore, the right hand and the right shoulder dip underneath, and that gives the spine a tilt backwards here. Now, I've got uh, quite a few people who I teach, and I get them to position here, and whether it's their eyesight or just their, their, their makeup, they'll tilt the head an awful long way back here. And whether or not their dominant eye is trying to get the, uh, the, the best view of the ball, I don't know, because obviously I can't see what they see. So we're into a, a bit more of a part of the game where there's a lot more trial and error from what you do 
And looking in a mirror is a tremendous way of really learning this. So when you're at home and you do have a club at home, I know some of you've got your, your kit here. If you have got your clubs at home, set yourself up and just ensure your head and spine are aligned. Any misalignment in that head will have ramifications throughout the positioning of your body as you address the ball. Now both, uh, well, Jack Nicholas started it. He used to tilt his head to the side slightly when he addressed the ball. Just before he took the club away, he'd do this. He'd move his head and then move the club. And his view was that if he tilted his head that way, it allowed a freer movement of his shoulders. Nick Faldo copied him doing that. So if you look at Faldo in any video of him in his prime, he'd make his waggle, he'd look down, tilt his head, and then make the move. Now that must have some impact on the ability to see the ball. Because as I look at a golf ball, I want the best view of it. If I tilt this way, my left eye now is looking at a very different angle than my right eye. But you've got to find your best way of doing it. And it's something which is well worth uh, an experimentation. When you're at home now and you're looking down, can you see the ball better if you tilt your head around into different positions? And it's amazing when you really focus on that, how you get into a, a very different view of the golf ball. You may well settle on your best one. I love looking at the ball from behind like this with a driver. It helps me optimize the smack at the back and underneath the ball. Remember we talked about the oblique strike or lacking the oblique strike. My best square strike comes from this angle here. And so I love looking at the ball from here. And as a, uh, a sort of golf learner in the game of the 80s and 90s, every child or every teenage boy like me would have aped Nick Fowler. He was the best player of Seven Ballesters at the time. And Fowler did this big head tilt and so we all did it. Whether or not it's a good thing, I don't know. So, as I'm setting myself up here, head and spine alignment is critical. It affects our eye alignment. Now, with the putter, this is really key. It's far more uh, important with the putter. You always hear people talk about having your eyes over the ball. The best way to think of that is to think of a pair of binoculars if you're looking at something. You'd hold the binoculars on your face and look forward. You wouldn't look down or miss a line like that. You'd look straight ahead. That's why our glasses sit on the front of our face here. Now with the putter, as I look down, you'll see an awful lot of good putters where they'll have the back of their head horizontal to the ground. It's the best way for you to view the ball. Some putters, you see a Tiger Woods does this, has the head slightly inclined upwards and he looks down his nose to the ball. Again, you've got to find your best way. And the best way of doing it is trial and error. So have a look in the mirror, have something behind you or a window behind you. And look at the different positions, see how your head looks or get someone to video you, what have you. And then have a good look at it. Now I know I put my best and I enjoy putting, it's a strong part of my game. When I really get into a soft posture, I have a good look down at the ball like this. And I use quite a short putter to help me do that. I'm six foot two, my putter is 34 inches long, standard putter the 35, but I have mine a little shorter. I like to get down here, and I really look like I'm looking right at that ball. From there, I know I make my best stroke by going backwards and forwards from there. If I lift up a bit too much, it means the putter's got more chance of swinging around here. If I get right over it, like this, I've got more chance of the putter going this way, backwards and forwards. For you, Ian, as the lefty, get right over it here. Again, backwards and forwards. And effectively, the putter should swing under your eyes, swing under your nose. And that's something you can do at home. Again, for the lefties, as I set up here and I tilt, my right side is higher and my left side is lower. But my head and spine are aligned. I don't want any misalignment there. Alrighty. So. Let me have a look through my notes here. Now, interestingly, when I say tilt the head to the side here, you may well lose sight of the ball. If I look at my pictures here, I'm going to show you one of my favourite photographs for discussing this. And it's Bernhard Langer. Langer's a very, very fit man. Uh, still winning tournaments uh, well into his uh, late 50s and his early 60s now. Still one of the one of the best players uh, of our generation, certainly. I'm going to zoom in on this one here. He's about to hit that drive. Look at his visor. That must be a 45 degree movement of his head. 
a huge movement of his head there, real tilt. Now, in his case, he, he tilts his head that way. It enables his trunk. Now, what I talked about last week, it may enables his trunk and his hands and arms to move back very freely. If we work from the ground up, we'll see his knees. Lots of activity in his knees. Then look at the top of his trousers, where his hips are and what have you. You can see he's pulled his right side of his body way behind him. Again, going back to the points I was making last time. All his trunk has turned. There's no resistance in vertical commas, resistance in that swing at all. He's, he's really holding his right side right behind him. And the head position is either move that way to allow that to happen, or there's so much movement in the body that the head has gone with it. But there's no way he's looking directly at the ball there. Now, remember the golf swing, we, uh, as talked about on Saturday, the golf ball's only on the club face for one two thousandth of a second. We're not going to see the strike anyway. Now, uh, Jack Nicholas, in, in an article I'm going to read to you later on, talks about he looks just at the golf ball. He doesn't look at a particular point at the ball. Some players look dead at the top, some at the bottom, and some at the very back of the ball, some slightly towards them on the inside of the ball. Even though they can still see what I've said in the past about absolutes and... Um, It's just saying my connection's unstable. Can you... Okay, it's fine. Um, about absolutes and uh, negotiables, the head movement is a negotiable. Now, if I then get a picture up here of uh, Cabrera. Try and find for you. Okay, it's Angel Cabrera. And again, you can see his head has moved there. That's tilted to the side. Now, if I can just zoom in there, it's not a great picture, but you should see a little bend in his left arm. About quite a big bend in his left arm. Probably close to 30 degrees of bend in that left arm there. Now, what I'm going to do next Wednesday is I'm going to make it a senior session. Uh, Quentin asked me to do some senior stuff. Uh, and next Wednesday is going to be our senior session. And pictures like that, a little bit more flexibility in his body, a little bit looseness in the swing. It's something I'm going to focus on for next Wednesday. So next Wednesday is going to be our senior session. So the head position there, as I'm talking about the Cabrera pictures there, is really means that there's a bit of freedom for it to go this way. <clears throat> what it doesn't do is go this way. Because like I said, it has a huge impact on the balance of the body. So a little bit of motion this way is absolutely fine. It frees up the body to turn. And you can also practice this at home in a mirror. As you make your motion backwards with the right side pulled backwards, Allow your head to go with it. Have a look at yourself in the mirror. And you'll see my head is still aligned to my spine. It's not lifted up and not gone down. Now, if you feel like by tilting your head a bit, it increases your range, then try it. Give it a go. Alrighty, so that's the outside of the head and its various positions for putting and uh, for the driver and what have you. Let's get inside the head now, the front part. Now. I'll be honest with you, this is my least favorite discussion point of the game. I love the swing, I love the game, I love the history of the game, but golf psychology, and I use the inverted commas there purposely, um, it's not something I particularly enjoy reading about, studying, or talking about, and there's so much mumbo-jumbo online, there's so much sort of mystical sort of derivative uh, instruction given on it. Um, there's some very good stuff online, because they talk about sequence and keeping your mind clear. Um, and obviously, I can't be right when I'm talking about uh, my dislike of golf psychology because I'm uh, some of the world's best players do use it. You know, notably Darren Clark and Ernie Els, both won the Open Championship uh, and openly use golf psychology. So it must work for them. Now, in some ways, they've got to the top of their game in terms of their swing and in terms of their ability to play the game. They're looking for what could possibly be the next weakness in their game. And if it is a bit of psychology, then that's what they've got to, to, to work on. Excuse me. Now, if we then look at, let me look at my notes here. As a coach, what I do know is that when people come to me for a lesson and we eventually get stuck to a good sequence, their goal psychology improves dramatically because they're just clear in what they're doing. And if I can teach you to swing better and hit the ball better, you'll hit more fairways, you'll hit more greens, you'll have less stress on your game because you're not hacking out the rough grass or in fairway bunkers or making problems for yourself. And of course, everything's at a spiral. When you're swinging well, you're more confident, you're enjoying the game, you find the game a little easier. And again, easier is probably not the, uh, the right word, a little simpler, because the sequence is there. And like I say, you're very hard to beat if you're hitting the ball straight down the middle of fairways and to near the greens and not putting yourself in bad positions. And this is when we start talking about strategy. 
because if you do start to miss in the worst positions, if you look at every fairway and every green, there's going to be good and bad sides to miss on. A good strategist will always um, be playing a strategy which, which takes pressure off their game. Now, Jack Nicholas is the ultimate strategist and the ultimate uh, mind player. Um, and he always said he aimed for the centre of the green. Now, I'm not sure I always believe everything these guys say, uh, but I think in general principle, what he was saying, he wasn't much of a risk taker. And if you look at the tournaments that he won, a lot of times he took fewer risks but played smart golf, and the person who'd made a, the mistake just fell away at the last point. Now, if we then uh, talk about the sequence of coaching, my job as a coach is to ensure that you get the squarest strike at the back of the ball. And I've said this many times now, if the strike is square, you'll hit it further with less dispersion. It's logical, because if the strike is at the back of the ball, we optimize how much power gets into the back of the ball, and therefore we optimize the line it flies up with less deviation, and also we optimize our power. If you have any oblique in your strike, you're going to lose power because of less energy going into the back of the ball, and you're also going to hit the ball less on target. And so per yard traveled, you become a lot wilder. And when we work on trackman, it's remarkable how often I see uh, huge results on just a slight improvement on the quality of the strike. And all of a sudden, the dispersion becomes less, but the increase in distance uh, is in, in a massive game. I had a single figure handicapper in uh, just before the lockdown, Jim. Um, and we improved his uh, range left and right by 43%. And he's a single figure golfer. That's a huge, huge difference there. It's now in this big curving shape to his swing. We really brought it in, got 43% uh, improvement. Now, if he's going to hit the ball 43% straighter off the tee and uh, into greens, he'll have much easier second, third shots because he's not hacking out of rough, he's not behind the trees and what have you. And so the psychology of the game really is dependent on your technique. And I teach technique is the first thing. And then we talk about your task. And your task is do you truly understand what you're trying to do? Now, a fairway bunk is a great example of that. If we have a lip so high, it doesn't matter how good your technique is, if you choose the wrong club, the ball is not going to elevate over. And so your true task in a fairway bunker is not to leave it in there and get it out of the, of the lip, not to worry about how far you've got to hit. So if you're 150 or 200 yards away, that's largely irrelevant in your club choice. Your club choice is down to getting the ball out of the bunker. Now, that's golf psychology, because that what you're doing there is you're playing smart. You're understanding your task. It's like uh, a high shot over a bunker. It's logical to think, I'm going to try and scoop it up and get it up in the air. But we know that in order for a ball to get up, our task is to swing the club under the ball. And if the club goes under the ball, the ball will jump up. So our task isn't necessarily to get the ball up in the air. It's to get our club under the ball, and the ball will jump up as a byproduct of the correct motion down here. So like I say, as a coach, I see uh, people's mental state of the game improve dramatically once the sequence of their technique works out better. Uh, and once they're truly understanding what they're talking about in their own swing and the dialogue they have with themselves in their own swing. Now, interestingly, uh, I've had spells when I've, been, when I've been playing badly. I really berate myself. I remember reading a book and it said, would you employ a caddy to shout at you every time you get a bad shot? And of course you wouldn't. You absolutely wouldn't. So my golf psychology had to change, and my sort of attitude to myself had to change in the golf course. And a bad shot's just a bad shot. The sign of a good golfer is how well they deal with that bad shot, because everybody's going to hit the bad shots. And I'm going to come to the Nicholas article shortly, uh, and he talks about how he deals with it. Now, interestingly, you'll hear me reference Jack Nicholas an awful lot. He's the best player who's ever played the game. He's also written the most amount of books as a player, and they've been published many, many times. Now. Golf is one of the few games where the world's leading expert has written so many books on it, and yet everyone else chips in, and we all sort of ignore Jack Nicholas a little bit and go, oh, what's he doing? What's he doing? What's he saying? And what, what can I read online? What's that bloke from you know, the middle of nowhere putting on YouTube? I'll watch that. And yet Jack Nicholas, the world's best player, has already given you all the information. And so many times I come back and reference uh, Jack Nicholas because I read it as a child, as a boy, uh, learning the game. And I see it every single day in my coaching of you. Now, I'm on an evolution as a coach. I should be on an evolution as a coach anyway. And every time I'm coaching you, I'm learning something all the time. Now, the message gets clearer and clearer every day, the more coaching I do, that what Nicholas talks about is relevant to the most amount of people. All righty, so I'll give you a couple of anecdotes that I've read over the years. An old pro who taught me years ago uh, at PGA school uh, was a referee at a Ryder Cup match. Uh, Arnold Palmer was playing. And he said, I, he said, I was walking down the fairway, Palmer hit his drive down the left, and the, the, the 
Great Britain Island player hit the ball down the right, and they were absolutely level. And uh, we walked up, and I looked at them both, uh, and I said, okay, it looks like you're pretty level, guys. And I said, before I could finish the sentence, Palmer glared at him and very forcefully said, I'm longest, I'll hit second. And so the other player sort of taken back a little bit, said, oh, well, I'll, I'll hit second. And this happened again later on in the round. And he said the force of personality of Palmer must have had an impact on the other player throughout the round. And it's a sort of a bit of a niggle there. There's very famous stories of uh, Tiger Woods' caddy, Steve Williams. And what he'd do is uh, Butch Harmon would train Tiger Woods and Steve Williams never to arrive on the tee on any part of the golf course, 1 to 18, before the other players, particularly the Mickelson. And what uh, Woods would do is let the other players arrive at the tee so they had to wait for Tiger Woods' arrival. That would also mean the crowd would change when Tiger was on his way up to the tee. When they got to the tee, Tiger would then have his presence felt because everyone was waiting for him. And um, uh, Steve Williams, the caddy, would then go and crowd um, the other caddies, whoever was the, the closest competitor to him. So what by that I mean, but what I mean by that is that Williams would take his bag, and if a caddy was stood, say, here, waiting on the tee, Williams would take his bag and he would stand directly in front of the caddy plonk his back down and obscure his view. Now, those are pretty tough things to compete with when you're against the world's best player, who's already got the aura of being the world's best player. But as Tiger went through that sort of spell, uh, six, 2006, 2007, 2008, where his moves seemed to be a little bit sort of, uh, you know, grumpy, so to speak, uh, he was getting more and more aggressive with other players on the course. I know they stopped all that now, and he's a much happier person by the look of things. Uh, but it just goes to show you the lengths that these players go to to, to compete. I remember watching old footage of, uh, again, Jack Nicholas on the first tee of the 1978 Open. And there's a chap called Simon Owen, who was a New Zealander. And he was leading uh, and playing the final group with Jack Nicholas. And they stood in the first tee. They'd not met before. And Nicholas walks up to him and says, where are you from? Quite brusque. And Simon Owen says, I'm from New Zealand. And Nicholas says, I know that. Where, whereabouts are you from in New Zealand? I said, oh, I'm a place called uh, Waranuga, or whatever it was. It's a very, sort of, very, very strong Kiwi name. And as he was saying it, Nicholas turned his back and said, never heard of him. And he really cut him dead. Now, again, the world's best player is proving his point there. You know, he's called the bear for a reason, right? Alrighty, so those are my views on golf psychology. And when people uh, come for lessons, oh, yeah, I'm not thinking straight. Ordinarily, I'll start with a technique and then things tend to smooth out a little bit. So it's technique followed by task, followed by self-management. Technique, get yourself swinging better. You'll hit the ball better, many more fairways. Once you're doing that, let's work on your task. When you go on the golf course, are you thinking correctly on each shot that you play? And when I play captain pro matches on a Sunday, you know, I see people making quite ambitious choices. Um, you know, what Jack Nicholas calls the circus shot or the heroic shot, the hidden shots which are just a bit too beyond their ability. So when you do get into a rough position there, just play the smartest shot you can, not the most aggressive shot you can or the most ambitious shot you can. And from there, we move into self-management. And I don't ever use the phrase course management because you can't manage 100 acres of grass. You can only manage yourself in the few uh, feet of grass that you're stood in. So you've got to control your, uh, your understanding of your ability. As Clint Eastwood said, a man's got to know his limitations. You've got to understand the position that you're in. And again, Tom Watson made a great quote. He said one of the biggest differences he sees between tournament players and club golfers is their understanding of the ability, of uh, the lie position that the ball is in. If the ball is sitting perfectly, we're on the same boat, but how rarely does it sit perfectly? And so good players totally understand the nuances of how a ball sits down, sits up, or where the grass is in relation to them. And if you look at the destination, they know the way towards the player. So when the ball lands, the grass is going towards us, its first bounce has a lot of resistance. Tiger Woods, uh, uh, when he won the Mass in 1997, had a, an average long drive of 324 yards. Think of that. Old ball, old club, 324 yards. It's never been better. What they've done at Augusta National now to Tiger proof the course, their words, is they grow the grass towards the players, so the first bounce has resistance, and also they've moved the tees either backwards or forwards so that when the ball lands, it lands into an upslope all the time. And so if you look back at old footage, at, uh, particularly down holes like 10 and 11, which are downhill at Augusta National, as the ball hits the fairway, bang, it runs forwards. Now you don't see that. You really don't see that. Um, so how did I get onto that? Uh, 
Oh, uh, about the uh, self-management. Now, if the grass is growing towards you, that's going to have a big impact on the quality of strike. It's much easier to strike a golf ball when the grass is growing towards the target because the ball has no resistance. The club has no resistance, so it slides and glides through the grass. As the grass is growing towards the club, it does get a bit stuck. Even when the players are swinging at 100 miles an hour with an iron, the club still gets stuck against that grass. So that's one example of self-management. Other examples of self-management are having your clubs clean, being arriving at the tee on time, we see it particularly on Tuesdays um, with the ladies' day. The ladies uh, will generally come in with plenty of time. They'll have a chit-chat in the shop, get to uh, speak to one of the pros, go and have a putt and a mill around. Uh, and on Saturdays sometimes, the men can be a little bit uh, tight for time sometimes. There's some regular uh, people come in uh, who are just that bit late for, uh, for their time. It's part and part of life living in London, I know. Um, but again, be prepared for what you're doing. That's self-management. Being on the golf course and being self-managed properly. You look at good players, they, they look in control of everything that they're doing. Now, when I go and play, my self-management is making sure I don't make silly mistakes. Uh, I never knock a ball out, uh, out of bounds on 10, 11 or 12. But I will often pull the ball too far left on those holes because I know it's, it's, it's too much of a risk to lose it out of bounds, 10, 11 and 12. I don't mind being too far left and dealing with those consequences. So you've got to work out what your... Uh, best self-management is look at your weak areas and then see how you can uh, uh, work on them all righty so i'm going to go now to uh this article here. i'm going to publish the uh, link to this article it's a golf digest article in his own words by jack nicholas his secrets now i said of course nicholas has written so many books on the game and so many of them, without realizing it, uh, focus on uh, what some people call golf psychology. He would just call it strategy and how you play the game smartly. Now, I remember reading an article about someone who knew Jack Nicholas well. He said, Jack finds everything easy because he's not easy, but simple because he's so organized. And he's, he, he sees everything in a sequence. If you go to his house, everything works, everything's in a sequence. And so he puts his golf into a sequence and so much of it is just common sense good advice okay so 1970 there are all kinds of nervousness i'm more nervous in the hours before i play once i get started that kind of nervousness disappears i wish they'd let me play all four rounds at once in about 17 straight hours he then talks about that's a look Okay, as a general rule, this is 1969, as a general rule, the rough does strange things to golfers. They stop thinking. Even experienced club players try to pull off circus shots they would never dream of hitting from a fairway line. And I love that, because you think what it's like playing with Jack Nicholson at Pro-Am. He is looking at you, he's watching you. Tiger Woods when they play in Pro-Am. And they're watching amateur golfers play amateur golf. Now, what he's saying there is, too many times he sees over ambition in the rough grass now as a rule if the ball's sitting down get your rescue wood out you must lofted rescue wood out or get your wedge your nine or your eight iron out because your five six seven iron your five wood it's just not going to work as consistent as the, as the other clubs that i mentioned now here again this is 1969 now this is a fascinating insight into the mind of why he's had such a long career at each tournament, some segment of my swing is sticking out more that week than it generally does. Consequently, I find myself fastening on some little gimmick that will help me either to feel right or to swing right for the duration of that tournament. It might be raising my right shoulder a little higher at the dress because that makes me feel more relaxed and makes a freer turn. Or it might be slowing down the push off my right foot at the start of the downswing because that seems to help my balance in the hitting area. The next week, it will be something else. When I mention to friends that I am forced to rely on this succession of gimmicks, I can sense that a number of them are let down to learn this. They would much rather hear that a professional golf has everything securely under control, that each year he gains an increased mastery of his technique. All I can say is that I wish this were so. So Gary Player famously quoted, um, saying that uh, Nicholas changes changes his swing every single week. Now, if we look at the videos of the, the swings of the top players, they seem to swing quite consistently. But inside what's going on is a lot of variety of thoughts, as he just mentioned there. He calls them gimmicks. He's trying to find something which gets a stick in his swing every single week. And it's a remarkable insight. Um, now, when he's swinging, when I asked him this question, 
last year. I met him last year. And again, I would class myself as being a reasonably good student of uh, Nick Klaus's uh, books and what have you, but to ask him the question that I asked him was just uh, affirmation, really, of what um, I'd read and what he talked about. But I said to him, I said, one of the questions I've got for you is how your right hip works and how that moves into the backswing. He said, don't think about it. He says, you guys think too much. So I said, okay, well, look, we've got track man, we've got video cameras. You never had that uh, when you were playing. So we've got the ability to think more and more. And he sort of winced a little bit. He just say, well, you know, who cares what you think sort of thing. Um, what he did say, though, he says, listen, if I was swinging a bit too upright, I'd take it a bit deeper. But if the ball was going left, I'd try and hit it right away. So he was very active and very nimble on changing his swing. Now, as amateur golfers, well, you're craving and your desire to be consistent at the game. Now, if the best player of all time is telling you you can't be that consistent, nor can you control the game, you have to adapt some of that into your game. Now, our relationship with you and your role, uh, our role as a coach and your, your um, chain of thought when you come for a golf lesson is you should always be looking to improve. Now, you should also be working on similar things each week. There are some fundamentals in the game we all need to work on. Now, if you master the fundamentals, which Nicholas clearly did, you know, that's holding the club in a certain way. It's positioning your body so that you can optimize movement and balance. Those are real fundamentals. How the body moves in the way back. And Nicholas would always talk about keeping the head still. Even though he had that tilt that way, he kept his head very still. So there were certain fundamentals in his swing, which he probably wouldn't have tinkered with, or he'd have come back to when he was playing badly. So well, am I moving my head? Do I need to keep it still? And so when he took his pre-season lessons every year, his coach would hold his hair, and the first thing to do is make some swings. His coach would be holding his hair, and Nicholas would swing around his head. As an aside here, uh, again, a bit more of the psychology of him, I read a fantastic book by Jack Nicholas's caddy, Angelo Arguella. Okay. Um, and uh, it's like 15 chapters, and each chapter ends with Nicholas giving his version of what the chapter's been talking about. So he said, it's absolutely factual. In 1979, Jack Nicholas only played seven uh, tournaments. Four of those were the majors, and three of those would have been uh, significant events. So get this right, there's seven majors, seven events uh, in a season, may have been eight, certainly no more. And he said, I want to spend more time on my business and more time with my family. And in the book, Argeo uh, says that um, in those days, the caddy was responsible for the players' clubs. So we'd, we'd take them back to our flea pit motels on the outskirts of the town where the tournament was being played, and we were responsible for them. And he talks about going out gambling and sort of womanizing and smoking and drinking all night and then waking up in the morning, possibly not in his own bed, and getting back to his motel, getting these clubs and then taking them to the tournament. Anyway, let's say it's eight events that Nicholas played that year. Three consecutive tournaments, Angelo Arguello slept in, slept beyond Nicholas's uh, tournament time. So Nicholas on the first tee of uh, big championships and having to either borrow clubs or on the third time it happened, he bought a set of clubs from the brush that he made with me. And this is all in the book. It's absolutely amazing insight to how the world's changed and how professional it's become. And Nicholas says, on the third time it happened, I was really brassed off. I'd had to get another uh, uh, someone from the crowd to come and caddy for me. And I'm walking up the fairway and I realised I bought a set of clubs which chefs I hate. He said, I'm walking up the hair and I realised I bought the wrong clubs, totally wrong specification for the aluminium chefs. And they were terrible when he you like playing steel chefs. Anyway, he still employed him. And at the end of it, he said, ah, oh, you know, it's just how Angelo was. So it just shows you how remarkably strong-minded he was as a pro and a player and how he would overlook certain things, which in the modern game, he, they just wouldn't overlook that. That's an aside, but it's also an insight into the, to the mind, right? Okay. He says then, in the greatest game of all, I feel that hitting specific shots, playing the ball to a certain place in a certain way, is 50% mental pitcher. 40% setup and then 10% swing. Again, it's all about the sequence. Has he truly understood his task? That's the 50% is the mental picture. What's he trying to do? 40% setup, that's his technique. So working slightly different to what I said earlier. So if he set up the ball and that's 40% of it, is he positioned in a way which will help him perform his task? If he's got those two things right, he's saying he's 90% on the way to hitting the ball exactly how he wants to hit it. 10% of it is his swing. So again, it goes to show you just how important the preparation is for each shot and for each round you play. Okay, a big part of managing a golf course is managing your swing on the course. A lot of guys can go out and hit a golf ball, but they have no idea how to manage what they do with the ball. I've won as many tournaments hitting the ball badly as I have hitting the ball well. 
And in a way, I'm more proud of the good rounds I've played while hitting the ball badly than of the great rounds while hitting the ball well. I mean, that is a huge, huge science in its own um, uh, right. And what a skill that is, which he cultivated over the years. He would have stuck to his game plan. He'd have taken very few risks and let other people make the mistakes. Now, I know a lot of lady golfers play uh, uh, match play, and the Pearson, the Centenary Bowls, and what have you, or the, the, uh, the matches they play home and away. How many times you lose a hole by making a mistake you wish you just hadn't made an unfort an unforced error? Uh, and I see it a lot on Sunday morning when I play Captain Pro matches. If I get greedy out of the rough grass or out of a fairway bunker or try to play heroic shot just to help uh, it's a whole lot that I don't need to make that mistake. Okay. Okay, finally here. Unpalatable as it may be, the truth is that you and I both and all who follow us into this great game are always going to miss far more seemingly makeable putts than we hope. Okay, well, we all know that feeling, right? So the point there is make sure you miss well. Easier said than done. Again, um, the old cards, the game is uh, never up, never in. That's when greens were slow. If you're watching yesterday, I went onto BritishPathe.com and typed in Roehampton. I showed a video of uh, Roehampton first tee here, Douglas Bader on the first tee, and many of the uh, great war heroes playing here. You can see the pro shop in the background. And they're playing here and uh, hitting shots. It's fascinating. It's 1963 video. There's also uh, another video in BritishPathe.com uh, of an instructional video taking place at Roehampton. And you see this uh, player hitting the putts. In old fashioned uh, uh, videos, you see the ball traveling very slowly and stopping very quickly. Modern greens are very fast. Current uh, fairways in the US PGA Tour uh, are faster than the fairways were in the 1970s. Just think of that. That's how fast the greens are now. Uh, is it the other way around? Um, you got that right? The speed of fairways now, yeah, faster than the greens in the 1970s. So never up, never in is nonsense. We all, when I'm teaching people to put, being delicate with the put is very, very hard because the ball will roll so quickly now. So in terms of knowing that we're going to miss putts, we have to miss well. So if you can get good control of the speed of a putt, then you become a good putter. And the way to get control of the speed of a putt is when you're on the putting green, don't put to a hole. Put to the fringe of the green. So stand in the middle of the green and just get the ball rolling and finishing on the fringe of the green. If you do that, you have, you have much less uh, concern about accuracy of direction, but you learn feel for distance. We're all, even the world's best players, three times better at accuracy than we are for feel for distance. And I can prove that to you on, a, on, a, on any, uh, with three balls. If you put three balls to a hole, next time you're down, you're in your carcass at home, have you put three balls to a hole, you're going to miss left and right with one third as bad as the miss short one. Alrighty, so I've got into great detail there about what Jack Nicholas thinks about uh, in the psychology of the swing and the game. So I had a great question from uh, John Cardwell about do we need to change the swing for different clubs? It changes itself really, John, because if we have short and long clubs, the feeling of the swing will naturally be different. The weight of that club and the length of that club will bring about many different feelings compared to a mid iron here, I've got my six iron here, of that club there. It has to. It's a completely different shape, and so the swing will feel different. And as I swing the club, a shorter club has an impact on my swing because it will swing less far. Very hard to overswing with a sand wedge. It's very easy to overswing with the driver. If the ball is placed in the same position, a different position, I beg your pardon, driver to wedge, that too will have a huge impact on the strike, how we strike the ball, and also how the swing feels. If I start my swing from over here, it's definitely going to feel different from over here. However, the fundamentals of my swing should stay the same. I hold the club the same way for each club and each shot, and I'm trying to pull my right side back for each shot, and I'm trying to swing to the best position I can and make a follow through. So my swing naturally feels different, but I will try and do the same swing for every shot, the same set of technique uh, and the same sort of uh, uh, non-negotiables in my swing for every single club. But of course, they're naturally going to feel different. All right, so I've covered loads of stuff today. Um, and when I was writing down and doing my plans and my notes here today, I could see how much of a general view I wanted to put into this. Uh, there's lots of information online about uh, the psychology of the game. And if it connects with you, then God bless you. I hope it, I hope it has a big impact on improving your game. 
like I say, from my point of view as a coach and the proof positive I have every single day, if your swing is in sequence and you're clear about what you're trying to do with your swing in a sequence, you can then improve your golf on the golf course, have fewer stressful situations, and therefore you'll play better, you'll feel better about your game. If you then adapt the, uh, the mentality of Jack Nicklaus saying you've got to improve your swing every week and sort of try and manage it, then that's much easier said than done. But when you are making consistent errors, you should be looking at that and say, well, how can I uh, get around that? With the help of the PJ Pro, of course. Alrighty. So if there are any questions, just type them in now. I'll give you a minute. Anything about what I've talked about or anything you want to talk about outside of what I've talked about, then feel free to uh, type it in. I hit a couple of shots and then wait for you to do that. Okay, Mel, does your head move down as you squat a little at the start of the downswing? It certainly does, but it doesn't change shape relative to my spine. My spine and my head will definitely move down. I hope I've got this video here. It's a hand. Because this is brilliant. Show your video here. Okay, great. So this is an 11 second video of Tiger Woods, and this will answer your question. Well, what I want you to do, I'm gonna show this video two or three times. I want you to look at this, and as he's doing it, fix a reference point with his head in the background. Now as his bum goes back, you watch. I watch his head dip down now, below the horizon. Big difference, eh? So as he squats, his head moves up and down, but it doesn't change in relation to his spine angle. So his head and his spine are aligned. So the bum goes out. So keeping the head still, and again, how lucky am I as a coach to have the access and the click of the fingers to get that sort of information up to answer a question? Years gone by, I would have perhaps known that uh, knowledge, but trying to convince you of it would have been very hard. Trying to say to you, so listen, that's, this is what the world's best players do. You might say, well, why do they say keep your head still then? But on a video like that, it's super easy. Does your head move? Yes. So it naturally moves. As my body moves, my head moves and it bobs up and down. There's lots of head movements in the swing. Now when Nicholas talks about keeping his head still, we know that when he moved his swing, his head went up as he hit the ball. But he was trying to keep his head as still as possible, but acknowledged that there would be movement within it. Alrighty. So if that's all the questions for today, I wish you all well. Thank you very much for tuning in. Um, can't wait to see you all again next time. Uh, any of the questions, do send me them via email, richard.harrison at rohamptonclub.co.uk. Uh, and uh, I'll use them as content um, in the sessions that we have together. So I wish you all well. Um, keep practicing, keep swinging, keep making yourself mobile. Thank you, Eugene. My absolute pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. Um, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, at home and keep tuning in. Uh, I've got juniors on Friday. I'm doing um, a technical session on Saturday morning and then uh, Ladies Day next Tuesday and next Wednesday will be Seniors Golf Day, specific session for senior golfers. Uh, anyone can tune in. It's just a, a way of um, emphasizing uh, changes that we might make for a senior player. I wish you all well and I'll speak to you all very, very soon. All the best. Oh, yeah. <laughs>